can hear me okay. Um, so yeah, thank you for the introduction. A um, bit of background about myself. So um, I've been working in the conservation sector for 20 years. Um, prior to that, I uh, studied environmental biology at uh, Royal Holloway, University of London. Um, and uh, I've always loved being outdoors and, and you know, being around in woodlands. I grew up in a, on a farm. Um, and my grandfather was a gamekeeper, so I spent my entire childhood out in the woods learning about nature. So, um, and it's very much driven the way I, you know, my career to date. Um, I've been working for the Wildlife Trust for 15 years. Um, I started off as a humble assistant reserve officer in Hampshire, managing uh, volunteer teams and working on the entire uh, Wildlife Trust estate. So um, I've got a nice, very background in land management. Um, and over the years, I've worked my way up through the through the uh, trust and now find myself as deputy director of estates and conservation. So um, it's very much a, a, you know, a passion of mine. It's a fantastic organisation to work for. Um, and the people are really just fabulous. You know, the staff, volunteers, members of the public, it, it makes the role um, so, so very special. Um, so my plan this evening is to talk about our new wilder strategy um, and what that means for Hampshire. Um, I'll be referencing examples from the Isle of Wight because there's a lot happening there at the moment, um, but these are all applicable to Hampshire. So um, in 2020, we launched our wilder strategy, which is a 10 year strategy. Um, it was due to go with a big whiz and a bang, but sadly COVID had that amazing impact and uh, <laughs> in a negative way. And, and it sort of hit the sidelines slightly. Um, 2020 was very much a year of survival um, and uh, we managed to get through, but it presented some real challenges for the organization. Um, and certainly in terms of reserves and management of people um, and what the impacts of COVID meant for our state um, and it certainly informed on how we manage the uh, access and other issues into the future. Um, but this is really where our strategy comes to life. And there's two main strands to it. Um, the first is in, in very broad terms is getting more people on nature's side. The second is making more space for wildlife to thrive. And these very much go hand in hand and it's very simple flow diagram, more people connected and acting in support of nature, more connected space where nature can be restored and the pressures on the environment reduced everywhere and every day. So what this actually means is that we need, have, we have ambitious targets and what we're looking at is inspiring one in four people to take action for nature's recovery. And that can mean one of many things, you know, that could be directly through volunteering for either for the Wildlife Trust or another NGO conservation body, um, for taking an interest, for being involved in community projects, um, or just working actively to, to promote their local environment. It's all about getting people inspired and importantly, getting young people inspired and giving them the mantle to take on for future conservation management. We've got some ambitious targets for restoring land and sea. So, you know, and we're looking at big targets, a third of land to be seen where wildlife is recovering. So giving wildlife the opportunity, giving the land the opportunity to recover and support wildlife. And we need pressure on nature reduced everywhere else. Um, certainly in Hampshire, we're seeing a variety of pressures on the environment. And we really need to look at these and how we can mitigate for this and manage this to give nature that chance to recover. And from that, we get all of those benefits that nature can bring us. So all of those ecosystem services, um, all of that well-being and health and well-being that's so important for our health, particularly highlighted through COVID. Um, and, you know, just giving up wildlife that opportunity to thrive, restore and address the balance. So there's two main mechanisms for delivering this. And this is very much in line with the trust core, core objective. So, our core objectives are, are management, conservation and education. So thinking about the education strand, Team Wilder. So this is very much our engagement outreach project. Um, and this is really starting to get going with a, of a number of projects. So, you know, the trust has been going for 60 years and we've been engaging with audiences for 60 years. Um, we've been doing all sorts of things through volunteering, through events, guided walks, schools, forest school, various school groups, university groups, ed adult education groups. We now have marine ambassadors. We have wildlife ambassadors, wildlife friendly gardening. So we're really good at this sort of engagement. But what we tend to find is that we're appealing to the same audiences time and time again. Um, we have a certain demographic that we hit really well. And outside of that, we reach really, really struggle. So part of this strategy is looking at not only improving people's connection with wildlife, 
but also targeting those audiences that we failed to reach so far and looking at that wider demographic of our community. So through Team Wilder, we're looking at establishing lots of community groups um, and giving them the tools to be self-supporting going into the future. This is something that's been missing in the past where groups have been set up and then have sort of dwindled out over time. But very much the focus of Team Wilder is giving the people, giving the community groups tools to keep themselves going into the future and persist in the longer term. So we have our Wilder Portsmouth up and running. We have Wilder Southampton, Wilder Basingstoke. Wilder White is now kicking off as well. So these projects are all starting to gather momentum. And we have dedicated officers engaging with the public, engaging with local authorities, parish councils to get good positive action for the local environment. I think this sums it up very nicely, this quote by Sir David Attenborough, every space in Britain must be used to help wildlife. And this is very much a focus of Team Wilder. So giving opportunities for people to engage with nature where they live, where they work and where they play. And you're looking to capitalise on unused space. Wherever you go, there's little green corners, unloved, unkempt, that can be adapted, can be promoted for wildlife, even in the most urban of settings and contexts. And it's about inspiring people to get hold of these areas, inspiring people to take action and get inspired and create wildlife. So, and I think one of the overriding things about wilder is that the common is good. So those common species that we all see day to day and love, you know, things like sparrows, butterflies, you know, whites, all the common stuff is so important. And it's those first things that people often connect with. And if the common are doing well, then that gives a chance for the rare, the threatened to thrive as well. And again, here's some lovely examples of how this project is working. So making room for nature through Team Wilder and Wilder communities. And there's some fantastic stuff going on. There's lots of information on our website where you can see the projects that are happening. Um, and, you know, you can make it applicable in any setting. That's the great thing about wildlife, you know, setting up bird boxes, setting up flower gardens, little herb, herb gardens, beetle banks, bug hotels. It's all easy, very inspiring for kids. Um, and, you know, you can really make some big positive differences in communities. So one of our key, uh, key focuses on, on generating this tipping point. So we've got this big ambitious target of getting one in four people inspired by their nature, natural environment. And one way to do that is to look at this theory of the tipping point. So um, if you get to the tipping point, then you're on the road to achieving your target. So, and this, uh, this distribution map looks, shows that quite nicely. So you have early engagers. So the two and a half percent of those early innovators, the people that are really passionate about the, the environment, really inspiring. They're really, you know, that is their key, that's their focus. Um, and then we have the early adopters. So people that start to get on board, start to thrive on, on, the, uh, on the strategy, on the, on the uh, topic. And then we have the early majority. And once you get into that early majority, it becomes a norm. And once you've hit the norm, then that tipping point starts to self-replicate self and you get that inspired point and that magic moment where social behavior crosses that threshold and spreads. So this is what we're looking to do and looking to achieve through our Wilder Community Program. And this seamlessly links into our wilder land and sea program as well. So this is the area that I'm really focusing on with the Estates and Conservation Directorate. Um, and our state is critical in this. And again, we've been going for 60 years. There's a lot of experience within the trust. Um, we have a wonderful array of sites and environments, huge support from a really passionate team of volunteers. Um, and we're delivering excellent work on the ground. But what it hasn't done is it hasn't rectified the fact that nature is in trouble. You know, biodiversity is crashing. Um, so our model, although it's not wrong, it hasn't changed and it hasn't addressed those issues. Biodiversity is still massively in decline. I'll talk a little bit about a little bit more about our estate and why that's happened a little bit later. But, you know, there's some shocking statistics out there. A few reports have come out through the years and I sort of summarise these on a, on a few slides. So, you know, the UK is ranked 189 out of 218 countries for its biodiversity intactness. So, you know, we're right down at the bottom, so far from ideal. Um, if you look at any of the species trends, you know, it's all pretty bleak, it's all pretty pessimistic. Um, and as, as these slides here show, you know, the declines in most of these bird species and mammals is, is just really quite distressing. And the reasons for that, you know, many are clear, many are less subtle, but 
certainly our land use, our development pressure, pollution, access are all having a major impact. And these are something that we seriously need to look at and address over the next 10 years if we're going to reach those ambitious targets for wildlife and recovery. Um, summary of the greatest drivers in, in change in England are, you know, you can see for yourself, climate change, pollution, urbanisation, these are all known to us. The threat of non invasive non-native species having a massive impact in certain areas and certain habitats. Um, the management of fresh water, uh, our ability to cloak with climate change, and that those impacts of climate change, moth decline. I, I'm an avid mother, and this year was horrific for moths those, through those early months of the year where it was so cold and the weather was so different. And they didn't pick up until sort of six weeks, eight weeks after after you normally start getting really good numbers in a variety of species. So we can see it happening around us. So we have to adapt our, our management of the environment to compensate for this and have to look at ways to try and combat climate change. And now is the time to do this. We are running out of time rapidly. You know, it's not only affecting moths, birds, migratory birds, all sorts of things are being affected. And changing agricultural moment, uh, uh, sorry, changing agricultural management has had one of the biggest single impacts um, in recent decades. The intensification of those systems and farming practice have really hammered a lot of wildlife. But, you know, again, there is hope on the horizon. Lots of new methods of agricultural practice coming forward. Young people coming into the sector, driving change and regenerative farming is becoming a buzz thing. Um, Urbanisation, we only know too well that the, the development pressure in Hampshire, um, around our office at Botley, you know, the, the development pressure around Whiteley is just vast, with thousands of new houses going in. Um, so the impact on resources, not only in terms of water, but sewage, um, the impact on surrounding wildlife, surrounding nature reserves is going to be need to be managed and managed carefully. But there is still opportunity here. That's the key thing, you know, with this development come more people. And if we can inspire people and inspire developments to do their bit for biodiversity, then all the better. Biodiversity net gain is now going to be part of planning. So, you know, there are opportunities to address the balance. Um, and the Wildlife Trust are working hard to look at options for delivering that so that we get real tangible benefits of wildlife, and not token bird boxes and bat boxes put up around development sites. Uh, pollution is a massive thing at the moment. So we've seen some pretty horrific pollution over the last few weeks, particularly with sewage discharges. Challenges from, again, relating to development pressure, uh, resources, impact on, on outdated systems, you know, combined sewer systems from the Victorian period are just inundated. Um, and there's a whole system change that needs to be implemented to correct a lot of this. So there's no sim simple single answer to many of our issues. We have to look at a very much a strategic approach at a top down and a top down position led by government implementing change for the better. We've seen some horrific diesel pollution in the river test this year. Um, and again, linked to planning, inappropriate planning of development and development of sites next to triple SI river systems. You know, the river test is one of the best chalk rivers in the country. And yet a huge industrial estate is next door to that site. And we've got a leaking diesel system that's pouring diesel into the river every time it rains. Um, you know, these things need to be addressed at a strategic and higher level as well. Land is used in many different ways in the UK, as we all appreciate, but, you know, stats here are, are quite interesting. 56.7% of it is farmland. Um, so, you know, farmland has a big part to play in biodiversity for the good and for the bad. So implementing better systems to manage our farmed environment have to be a key way forward. Only 8% is fully protected for wildlife, triple SIs, and of that, only half of that is in good condition. I'd like to say that almost all of our reserves are in good or recovering condition. Um, so triple SI management is fundamental to what we do. So how do we tip the balance in the other direction and help nature recover? Well, there's a variety of mechanisms, um, but it's not rocket science really. All wildlife needs is bigger, better and more joined up places so it can thrive and expand and, and spread out and be more resilient into the future. We've done a lot of mapping of the area and you know it shows that there's between 30 and 50 percent of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight has potential for recovery. So this is very much driving through our wilder strategy, seeking opportunities to deliver big landscape scale recovery programs to allow wildlife to thrive and expand into sustainable populations for the future. 
So when you look at our estate in Hampshire, hopefully you can see the little red marks point to our reserves. Um, we're now managing around 11,000 acres across two counties. So a considerable land holding, but given the scale and given the representation you hear, you can see it's tiny really. Um, and certainly what has happened is that our estate hasn't helped in stopping the declines in biodiversity. So the wildlife just have always had this sort of niche market for managing those small, highly sensitive, highly protected sites. Either they're crucially important for a particular species or a particular habitat type or assemblage. Um, and that's been our been our really our, our, our key sort of remit, if you like. Um, it's our key specialty as an NGO. Um, these bits of land are often areas that were too difficult to farm or too difficult to make any money from, so it'd been left for wildlife. Um, and that has been our niche for a, for a very long time. So whilst we've maintained and enhanced and protected these sites to a very high degree, these haven't stopped the decline in wildlife and biodiversity around them. So we've created these little islands of fantastic wildlife, but surrounded by either in urban development or agricultural land. So we've created these little islands that just aren't sustainable into the future. So what we're now really focusing on is, is joining these dots up and promoting these sites as areas from which wildlife can thrive. So influencing the management of the land around us. So through land advice schemes, through direct ownership of land, through working with local landowners. And we've taken a lot of inspiration from some of the big rewilding projects. So, and obviously NEP is the one that everyone's familiar with and knows well. Um, and what they've achieved at NEP is, is truly fascinating, it's an amazing model. It just goes to show what you can do by just letting taking the pressure off and letting nature do its thing. And what we're seeing is recovery from intensively managed land into thriving ecosystems that support a huge array of life. And ne what NEP has shown is species like turtle dove and nightingale will recover if given the opportunity and given the habitats they need. Um, purple emperors are thriving in the uh, oak and the sallow woodlands. And enigmatic missing species are being returned um, and perhaps one of the most important for our work is that fabulous eco-engineer, the beaver. So we've started to do our own little thing in Hampshire as well. So this is Barton Meadows near to Winchester, where we've taken on this former arable field and turned it into a fantastic wildflower meadow. It's, it's the very simple process. It's been quite a simple restoration, but it's been truly captured the hearts and mind of the local community. You know, those fields full of flowers, full of invertebrates, it's just a lovely area to walk around. You, you get a buzz of the insects, the calls of skylarks and mellow pipits. Um, and it's a very inspiring place and lots of families go there and spend time enjoying that area. As I said earlier, what we're looking to do is link up our estate as well. So this is on the Isle of Wight, this is through the Eastern Yarra River catchment, and this shows the wildlife trust tenure in this area. So creating these corridors of connectivity. So this is all land that's owned by the Wildlife Trust and shows what can be achieved with a bit of strategic thinking and a bit of you know relationship building with local landowners. This is a really important area for the trust. This is four and a half kilometers of uh, river channel in trust tenure. Um, and this is gonna feature heavily in the Isle of Wight plan for beaver reintroduction. To the east of, sorry, to the east of this site, um, this links into a neighboring RSPB reserve at Brady Marshes, where a thousand acres of land is managed for wildlife. Um, we were talking earlier about wet the better. Um, and that is certainly the, uh, the mindset of the RSPB warden who has achieved so much on this huge area of floodplain, re-wetting large parts, creating lots of swamp, and the recovery of wildlife there has been immense. So breeding bittern, breeding marsh areas, the white-tailed eagles spend an awful lot of time on that site. So it's a haven for wetland birds and associated fauna and flora. And we've now started our first little venture into uh, rewilding as well. So this is a little Ducksmoor. This is a site on the Isle of Wight. Um, it's one of our nitrate mitigation sites. When we first took the site on in the start of 2020, it was um, had been growing maize for anaerobic digestion. And we inherited these fields of maize stalks and, and bare ground. Um, and we weren't sure what to expect and what was gonna happen over the course of the, of the year. So we've taken a very hands-off approach to the management. We've just let nature do its thing and recover. And it's fair to say it's thrown up a number of surprises. Um, alongside the uh, arable, were some uh, chicken areas. So these were had barns on where free range hens were, were, um, were grazing and being moved around. 
Um, this area is heavily um, enriched through uh, chicken manure, so lots of nitrate loading into this area. And again, very green, very lush. We thought, well, what on earth is going to happen with this site? Um, and there are a couple of fields of fodder radish that have been left um, as a winter cover crop. Um, so we decided to leave those for the birds. And uh, that was a, another interesting journey. So what's happened is that the site's proved to be phenomenally important for arable flora. So when you take the brakes off, when you take the hands off management, let nature recover, you get this amazing burst of life. So that all of this stuff is in the seed bank there waiting to emerge. Loads of amazing flora has come up on this site, including within the chicken, the heavily manured enriched chicken areas. We've had some archaeophyte plants are, <laughs> appear, including you know, the notable, notable upright goose foot, which is one of the rarest plants in the UK. In 2020, it was found on two sites and Little Duxmoor was one of them. So the little ducks, as you can see, is this sea of brown and green and beige in amongst a very much farmed, improved grassland area. So much of the uh, farmland around here is grazed with sheep um, and the surrounding fields are pretty much monocultures of rye grass, uh, high sugar content commercial grass lays that have been sown to fat and livestock. And they do that remarkably well, but unfortunately there's just no biodiversity amongst it. It's truly a desert of just grasses, the odd skylark or the odd meadow pipit trying to breed. In 2020, that large field you can see in the centre of the screen had five pairs of skylark nesting on it. This year it had six pairs, so already biodiversity is starting to thrive. We started to see reptiles on site, adders, um, grass snakes. Uh, we've got barn owls and kestrels hunting regularly over the ground. We've had white-tailed eagles roosting. Uh, the small vole numbers, small mammal population has exploded with the cover and the suitability of the vegetation. Um, and butterfly and dragonfly numbers have increased as well. Again, another aerial shot. You can see the site clearly. It's in the nice brown areas in amongst the enriched greens. <laughs> and in terms of flora, we found some fabulous stuff, as I mentioned earlier. So things like field wound work, enchanted nightshade, hairy tear, buttercup species. And things like hawk's beard, fluellens, the vetchlings, square stalks and John's work, smooth tear. And then amongst them, some real real specialties and real rarities, things like this spreading hedge parsley. So our, our botanist who was carrying out a lot of our surveys found this plant and did a little dance on the site when he found it because he was so excited. Uh, there's several records on the island each year, but it is a notable arable flora um, threatened with extinction within the UK. And these all thrive in these, you know, these bare ground systems um, and were once much more common in arable settings until the advent of modern agricultural techniques, pesticides, plowing regimes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so now part of our role is to try and work out how to manage these sites. And this is where this great paradox of wilding and rewilding comes in. So these are very much successional habitats um, and trying to replicate them through a wilding process is, is one of the interesting things that I'm sort of looking at at the moment. So in an ideal world, we'd probably try and manage this um, through grazing pressure, so looking at the use of cattle and pigs to create bare ground conditions rather than having to create, artificially create these areas. Some nice examples of the wildlife that have, you know, thrived on this site, so some fantastic photos. You'll notice a squirrel that jumped up onto my back. This is actually a wild red squirrel. Um, <laughs> I was attending site with a contractor to look at some fencing works and this little chap came jumping out of one of the adjoining woodlands and uh, bounced around us before jumping up onto my shoulder. So um, unbelievable experience. Um, as I say, it's a truly wild squirrel, but he had absolutely no fear. So um, yeah, one of my uh, most uh, amazing wildlife encounters. But it's fair to say, when you look at a project like this, you do come under a lot of scrutiny. Um, and certainly from the local agricultural community, there has been some kickback about what we're doing and their views on wilding and rewilding. Um, it's been often cited to me that we're taking away food production land um, and those key supporting functions for agriculture. So, you know, there is no straw, no hay, there is no produce being produced from that land, which is seen as a waste by many in the agricultural sector. Um, the great irony on the Isle of Wight is that 20% of the arable land is being used to grow crops for anaerobic digestion, which is just utterly and it still amazes me to this day how just un, uh, how appalling that really is. Growing crops to create green energy is probably one of the greatest tragedies of our modern age. 
Um, it seems an absolutely ludicrous thing to do. So um, fair to say I will not be held accountable for the loss of food production by creating wilder sites that where biodiversity can thrive and redress the balance of uh, losses caused by agricultural practice. This isn't about alienating farmers and the farming community, it's about getting them to farm in a much more responsible way and adopt new techniques and better ways of working with the environment to get a balance between food production and caring for our biodiversity. What we want to see is much more of this, you know, open natural pasture. We've lost 98% of our meadows since the Second World War, and it would be great to see meadow restoration being much more widely promoted. Um, we all know that while natural pasture is much better for grazing animals, they produce less methane being reared on natural pastures opposed to enriched monocultures of agricultural grasses. And it's much, much better for biodiversity. Scrub clearance, our sector has probably been one of the most uh, promoters, one of the biggest promoters of scrub clearance and we bang on about it on our estate all of the time. Our protected classic national, uh, wildlife trust estates, our small reserves, chalk downlands, our heathlands, we're always clearing and cutting scrub and probably been a bit too obsessive over the years. And what we've failed to do is uh, been able or had the ability to do is embrace these natural processes and these transitional habitats. You know, scrub is vitally important. And unfortunately for most of our estate up until this date, it hasn't featured strongly in our, in our management. Most of our estates heavily designated and protected and scrub is seen as the bad per, the bad habitat that encroaches onto chalk grasslands or heathlands or wet meadows and leads to a loss of biodiversity. And actually we should be embracing more scrub and as certainly as NEP has shown us, scrub is so important. And these transitional habitats that expand out from rewilding areas are just so key to a whole range of species. So very much within our strategy, within our wilding sites, this is what we're looking to achieve. So allowing that nice scrubby mosaic to establish, working with that sort of trying to em emulate a natural system with grazing pressure, um, getting the grazing density right. So you allow this natural regeneration to happen um, and create this mosaic of habitats resembling sort of a wood pasture scrubby mosaic. So, and we are all aware of how rewilding helps us. So, you know, obviously a huge amount of benefit for us as, as a race, the human race, and also for uh, ecosystem service value. So we're looking at ways to uh, improve this, improve our climate resilience, provide natural climate solutions. And a lot of our work is focusing, focusing around missing species. Um, perhaps restoring one of the environment's greatest eco engineers is um, one of our key drivers for the next few years. So of course, I'm talking about the beaver. So um, I've always been a fan of uh, beavers and their role in the environment, but it's over the last few years that I've really started to look into this and do my research. I've been lucky enough to uh, visit a number of sites in the UK um, and work with uh, the likes of the Devon Wildlife Trust um, to look at project sites and how these have uh, really, really been transformational in their in, in their impact for biodiversity and for ecosystem services you know and we really strongly think they should be part of an integral green recovery system they are nature's great ecosystem engineer and they provide huge benefits to biodiversity health and functioning of river catchments and the reduction of some of those negative aspects we're seeing in a lot of our waterways and systems they reduce downstream flooding they improve water quality they capture carbon helping tackle climate change um, they provide a whole range of different wetland environments that a low, wide range of other species can utilise. And they're great for fish, they're great for invertebrates. Um, and they're also a fantastic tool for promoting our work and what we do. They're great, they're a fantastic tool for ecotourism. Um, and, you know, certainly the evidence coming out of Devon and the wildlife trials they've been doing there is really showing this. So we have some fantastic wetlands within the Trust. Um, this is New Church Moors and the Isle of Wight. But certainly, you know, Fish Lake Meadows, um, Winnell Moors, a lot of our test and itching sites have potential for in the future to how, be homes for beaver and for beaver populations to be restored to. But our first steps to look at a project on the Isle of Wight. So this is going to probably lead the way for the trust. Um, and we're looking to apply for a license for an open wild release in 2023. So a lot of focus is gearing up on that for next year. 
uh, lots of work to do, lots of feasibility work, lots of consultation and public engagement to do, um, but a very exciting project which is going to pave the way for a future release into, into Hampshire. So beavers are fantastic, they create dams, they create stores of water, big ponds, big areas of life. Um, these little rivulets, these little riffles that flow around dams and, and uh, other impoundments, um, just huge variety of habitats. Dams are porous, they're fantastic for trapping sediment, phosphates, nitrates, cleaning up rivers, um, and they're not barriers as often perceived for fish movement. Fish can navigate through around dams. Um, dams often have these little rivulets flowing around them or over them. Um, and all of these <clears throat> impacts can be managed as well. Um, I love this slide. This is from uh, Utah in the States, um, and it just shows how resilient beavers are. Um, so this is a beaver wetland that you can see was completely unimpacted by a huge fire in the area. So, and as you say, this is, would have been a haven of uh, wildlife to escape to out of the fire's reach. Um, and it just goes to show what beaver systems can do in the natural environment. So as I say, we've been working with the, with the Devon Wildlife Trust and they've been very helpful to our, our plans for a beaver release. Um, so they've been supplying us with lots of data and information and all this is now widely available in the public domain um, and can be reached through their website. But the River Otter Beaver Trial is perhaps leading the way in showing what beavers can do and achieve um, in our natural environment. Um, there's some key stats for you here. So 28 dams built, 3.7 acres of beaver pond wetland created huge increases in habitat for aquatic species. The number of frog spawn found was, went astronomical, went through the roof um, through the uh, creation of beaver ponds and led to much greater improved biodiversity. Um, and you know, it's not only about the biodiversity, it's also about the ecosystem service of, as I've already mentioned. So flash flood prevention. So this little graph of the hydrograph um, shows that, that attenuation of rainwater being released slower for longer duration and reducing that risk of flooding down into downstream catchments. It's also about water quality as well. So um, above beaver dams, below beaver dams, those bottles tell you all you need to know. So beaver dams are fantastic at trapping sediment, plus all those pollutants are often in the water as well. So nitrates and phosphates, other nasties leading to the water below them being much clearer, much better. And that's particularly relevant to a lot of extraction that happens within our systems as well. So vast amounts of water come out of our rivers for, for human consumption. And if we can aid the uh, quality of that water through beaver damming, then that can only be a positive thing. And as I said earlier, the ecotourism and wildlife watching benefits are, are vast as well. So we're seeing from Devon, we're seeing increased footpath use, increased numbers of visitors going to look at beavers, people being inspired by beavers, you know, beavers acting as that flagship species to hook people in and get inspired about their wildlife. Thus, you know, extending that reach to that one in four, creating more interest, more local interest, and also supporting local communities. Already in the early days of our, uh, of our work on the island would be that we've already supported a number of local businesses through accommodation, through meals, um, and we're keeping a record of that to help inform how this can actually help local custom. Um, so we do get a lot of concern about beavers and the impacts and potentially potential flood risk, um, impacts on farmland. Um, and, you know, these are quite with, with, within their right to be concerned. The beavers can have a negative impact at time. But one of the uh, great things about beavers is they're quite easy to manage. So this little contraption is called a beaver deceiver. Um, and this is basically a pipe that runs through the dam um, and you can moderate and manage the water level behind the dam um, to solve any upstream or downstream flooding issues. So the beavers don't get these beaver deceivers. They continue to build the dams higher and higher without realising the water is flowing through the pipe. Um, so a very simplistic way to manage water levels. Um, perhaps one of my favourite and most easy ways to mitigate for beaver gnawing of trees is to paint your tree with a sandy uh, sandy paint. So this is an oak tree that someone's just painted a sand based paint over and beavers won't gnaw the sand because it's uh, it damages their teeth. So their teeth are so important to beaver that anything that's abrasive they avoid like the plague. Um, so this is a very simple mechanism. You can also just wrap a bit of wire around a tree so you can protect fruit trees and trees in people's gardens and specimen trees from beaver attack. It's also very easy to mitigate for beavers by managing with fencing. So uh, this is an enclosed area in one of the Devon sites. 
but this fencing can also be used and applied when they're damming in inappropriate places. So you can add electric fence dams um, to stop them being constructed or, or being uh, built higher. Um, so fencing has its role to play as well. I mean, I could talk for hours about beaver, so I'm gonna rein myself in and talk about some of the other introductions as well. Um, this is one of the white-tailed eagles. This is a 2019 bird. Um, so this is one of the first batch of birds. And the eagle project has really shown us how, you know, the reintroduction of a charismatic megafauna um, can really capture people's hearts and minds. Um, I was very much part of this whole process in the early days, helping support the Roy Dennis Foundation and Forestry Commission with the, uh, with the license application and the release, um, and being part of the consultation, speaking to local landowners and local people about the uh, eagles and what they could do. So what we found is that they truly have inspired a huge range of people um, because they are so huge. They're just so amazing to see. They're like flying barn doors and people have really captured the, uh, the hearts and minds and really huge numbers of people spend an awful lot of time watching and, and engaging with these birds. They're nice and easy to see at a number of locations on the island and now across Hampshire. They've been frequenting the Beaulieu estate of late. Um, and uh, people spend a lot of time looking, taking photos, um, and getting to know and understand their local environment as part of this. What was interesting when these birds were first released, the number of reports of eagle went through the roof. And what we found was that people were suddenly looking up into the sky and seeing buzzards, perhaps for the first time. So now the role of this bird in, in connecting people with nature cannot be understated. So these, you know, these really inspire people to get involved and understand their local environment. So as well as the big charismatic megafauna um, and the eco-engineers, there's a role to play for other species and certainly our wilder strategy is enabling this. So we're also looking at feasibilities for chuff reintroduction and sail bunting in reintroductions. Again, species that have been lost due to agricultural practices, um, changes in land use, um, but we now feel we have the mechanisms to deliver the, the favourable habitat for these species and look to reintroduce these species to our areas. Um, there are a number of ways to do this. So working with local landowners, um, new stewardship schemes are helping farmers apply environmental options to their land, and that will favour species like the chuff and like the cell bunting. So again, there's lots of work going on in the background to help facilitate new introductions like this. Of course, any introduction is done in line with the IUCN guidelines, and we have a strict internal policy on reintroductions that has to be uh, followed before we can even consider re-releasing or reintroducing an animal into our environment. It's often controversial, but we only we feel that all of the suggested species are, are you know, hugely important to our systems and, and would merit. So going back to our estate and the role our reserves have played over the last 60 years. So as I said, our, our, reserve, our estate has been key in supporting those vitally endangered species, those rare habitats, those rare species. Um, and whilst for the last 60 years it hasn't really changed the biodiversity crisis, it hasn't stopped the decline in species, what it has done is provide sanctuary areas for these species to expand and, and, and thrive from. So very much our estate is key in our new wilder strategy. These are the areas from where wildlife will expand, will spread from and allow to seed into new sites. As we start to get new reserves, as we start to influence land management, as our wilder communities start to do their thing, there'll be many more opportunities for wildlife to spread. Um, this is Battersea Common in Emma Bog. Um, this is a site that I, I know very well and love. Um, it's triple SI for its acid and heathland on uh, Battersea Common, and Emma Bog is a special area of concentration for its transitional mires and quaking fen. Um, it's a really special little reserve um, and, you know, it's been managed very well, um, but again, it's in a little bit of an island um, with much quite intensive ag agriculture around it. And then earlier this year, we had the opportunity to acquire some land around this site. And this is a reserve officer's dream. So we've managed to add another uh, 30 odd hectares onto this site, which has actually shortened our boundary, which has been fantastic. What a, you know, what a great result. You've got a bigger site and less boundary to manage, which is you know, the, the dream. Um, so this has enabled us to um, expand the site and importantly will now give us an opportunity to create more diversity, establish and restore habitats on the area. 
Um, and this is a massive win for us. This is a fantastic result. So we're really looking forward to uh, having more, more space, more areas for wildlife to thrive. Um, and again, acting as a, a sink area for wildlife to expand out from and into the local area. A lot of this area will be will have no public access, so the new land will be free from public access, um, and that will give the opportunity for the for those hab habitats to restore and, and not suffer disturbance. Unfortunately, Emma is Emma and Battersea is seeing an increase in, in recreation, and this is one of the impacts that we've been um, man having to manage through COVID. It's been quite an interesting experience. So it was very much like foot and mouth in the early parts of 2020 when lockdown first kicked in. There was hardly anyone out and about on sites. We were starting to see ground, besting, ground nesting birds thrive, numbers increased dramatically, um, wildlife was more visible. Um, and then suddenly when the uh, Boris announced the fateful easing of lockdown, the environment suddenly became inundated with people. And you know that presented a great opportunity for us to engage um, and you know, encourage people to visit our sites and learn to love and appreciate the local wildlife. But it also presented a number of challenges in terms of antisocial behavior, huge numbers of dogs running right across reserves. Um, and at a time when we were still struggling with low staff due to furlough. So, um, and what we've seen over the last year is that escalation in access has continued. Um, and certainly over the winter of 2021, we saw quite considerable impacts on a number of sites. Um, due just a footfall alone. So a very wet winter exacerbated this, but also the fact that people were trying to socially distance. So they were trying to keep two meters apart. So the natural form of pass was, was being spread across a wider area. And in some sites, in some reserves, we saw massive detrimental impacts. So uh, forest rise going from two meters wide to six meters wide with the loss of those important transitional habitats um, and areas that were previously good for wild, woodland flora. Um, and just the wear and tear on, on infrastructure as well. So this is going to be an increasing theme as development pressures hit our environment. And in some sites, you know, we're looking at options to manage access by creating um, hard surface paths, um, managing access, managing path routes to facilitate people and, and control where people go. But at the same time, trying to balance the needs of wildlife and not urbanize our reserves as well. So there is a tricky balance. Some sites it's easier to deliver these sorts of works. Other sites, they're much more rural, much more wild settings. Uh, so a continued challenge as we move along. So these are some of the photos of those transitional habitats and the bog mire, um, Emma. So this is this is a great photo of the bog showing this amazing diversity of wetland, wetland habitats, some really nice little species in there, things like bottle sedge and white sedge, um, bog bean and uh, sharp flowered rush, all sorts of good stuff in there. Very good for birds through the autumn, winter. So we get lots of snipe, um, jack snipe on this site. It's also a good site previously for nightjar and uh, woodlark, but we're having trouble with access and dog disturbance at the moment. So we're looking to try and manage that as we move forward. Um, there's some nice little woodland. It's got that wild feel to it already on this site, which is quite great. So as you can walk around the site, you come into areas of light and shade, the boardwalks run through the woodland. So it's just a fantastic place to go and walk. And again, some of these bog and wetland habitats, tussock sedges as you walk through the reserve. And again, this is Battersea Common showing the, the heathlandy areas, the acid grasslands and uh, the scrubby, scrubby corners, all fantastic for wildlife. On to Fish Lake Meadows, which has really proved to be one of the jewels in the crown of the, of the Wildlife Trust. Um, formerly managed agricultural land in the 90s, lots of infrastructure in to drain the site to make it manageable for, for grazing. Um, I think even crops were grown on parts of it. Um, and then abandoned um, and then the trust took over in the last few years and we've inherited this lovely wet wild swamp um, full of reeds and, and wetland habitats these lovely iconic sort of dead trees throughout um, and it's just been an absolutely amazing site um, joe edenden the reserve officer sent through lots of photos of the wildlife sightings um, she sent through a fantastic photo of a snipe today and obviously the office sprays are a big draw for this site frequent the site regularly um, and to think this is right in the heart of uh, of Romsey is, is just fantastic. Um, we've got some fantastic data on fish and, and the actual streams and the waterways inside the site are much cleaner than the river systems around it. So it's a very interesting site and we have big plans moving forward for this site over the next few years. 
Again, moving on to Southampton, this is our lower test reserve. Um, and again, this is a really important site for us. Um, we've also acquired more land through, Manor, through the acquisition of Manor House Farm, thanks to an EA project. Um, and this is a large, robust wetland site. And this is a, an interesting site because it's going to enable us to develop habitats with sea level rise. So this is site at the top of Southampton. So as sea level rise encroaches and this estuary system develops, we'll be able to map out how those changes occur on the vegetation communities and the wildlife um, and how these habitats migrate in land. Um, I like this aerial photo because it shows that urban context as well, how you know people, wildlife, industry can coexist um, and thrive, but needs to be managed sensitively. Um, the estate I mentioned that was leaking diesel into the river test is the one you can see on the right hand side there. So, you know, and when we're looking at protecting sites into the future, planning has to has to look at this as well. We have to be very careful around planning and where we enable sites and industry to be based. Um, and if it is based near a triple SI and SPA and Ramsar site, that adequate provision is made so in, to ensure no spills can occur on these reserves. Another nice little aerial shot. So in a variety of uh, wetland ecosystems, wetland habitats, um, and it's just a fabulous mecca for, for wildlife, a huge array of plants and wildlife. Um, and really it's about making that accessible to all um, and making the common good, promoting the common so that the, uh, the rare can thrive. Species like the lapwing, huge target for us. I've spent a lot of time managing sites for lapwing over the years. And we're just seeing, you know, numbers starting to increase in the Solent across our estate and across other landowning areas. Lots of work has gone into promoting, promoting good conditions for breeding waders. And we're at the cusp of seeing some really good recovery. Um, so it goes to show that despite all the pressures, despite all the threats, we can still do lots of stuff to promote wildlife and expand populations of really iconic species into our environment. So the take home message really is to be part of that nature recovery network. Um, and that can involve various forms. So rewilding, farms making space for wildlife. Our nature reserves in our state are key to this. And then using the urban space and the urban gardens to help support that system. So that's Wilder 2030. I hope I've kept the time. Thank you for listening to me. Um, and I must say a big thank you to all of our wonderful photographers um, and like to uh, just credit them here for the fantastic shots they get from our sites. <laughs>